Hey, I'm Josh from Bruno Cutlery, and we'll be sharpening this Sakai Kikomori 210mm Nihonko carbon steel Gyuto with Japanese whetstones. This is going to be really analogous for lots of different knives. Uh, Western knives, Japanese knives, a uh, number of different geometries. But So this is going to be looked at as kind of um, an introduction and kind of an overview of our technique. We'll be using our Takara Zakushi 1000 grit ceramic stone. Uh, the Atoma 140 flattener, spring-loaded whetstone holder, and then a little kind of um, fleecy mat thing here. And this stone has been soaking for about 15 minutes. They fill up with water pretty quick. Before we get started, I want to make sure my stone is flat. So... I like having a sponge in my water bath so I can squeeze out a little bit of water. You can also use a little squeeze bottle. Short strokes with your uh, flattener. If you go really long, especially if you go long in one direction, you're gonna uh, create a tilt in your stone. So little short strokes are the best. And look to see that you've removed the entire X that you laid down with your pencil. This wasn't really out of whack, so the uh, pencil is removed real quick. And you'll notice that there's some slurry left from the flattening there. And I uh, highly recommend using your flattener, be it a diamond one or a different type of flattener, to generate a little slurry before you use this stone. Harder stones like this really benefit from uh, raising a little bit of mud beforehand. This extra grit that you start with will help speed up the cutting, keep the, um, the metal from glazing. So now before we get started sharpening, uh, and actually before we even picked our stone, we should have looked to see how dull the knife was. I kind of knew where this one was. But we want to know, uh, if the knife is extremely dull, then we want something a little more aggressive than a thousand grit stone. If you can look at the edge of the uh, blade, so rather than feeling the edge like this, if you look at it and you see light reflecting back to you, you should probably use something a little bit coarser than a thousand grit stone. You want to get the metal removed as quickly as possible to reset your bevel as quickly as possible and keeping the bevels flat in the process. If it takes you 20 minutes to raise your burr with your first stone, your chances of keeping flat bevels are greatly reduced and chances are you're gonna get rounded bevels which won't uh, cut as long. To get started, we're going to be working off of a pinch grip. Our thumb goes into the heel, forefinger goes up onto the spine. These fingers are doing most of the gripping. These are going to be helping us stabilize. Index finger shouldn't hang down too low. Should be the corner of your finger that's on the spine here. We want to have a straight line going from our elbow to our wrist to the tip of the knife as you look down. So we want to avoid having a bent wrist this way or this way. This is going to be the place where we put the most exertion in. Keeping this wrist locked tight is where we're going to be putting in hard work. We want our elbow loose. We're not going to be putting down a ton of pressure. This is where the work happens. To help us find our angle, two quarters. This works for most uh, most chef's knives. Not so much for slicers or petties that are narrow, but it's very inexact, but pretty reliable. But you gotta take them off to sharpen. I'm gonna add just a couple drops of water. You don't need to over irrigate your stone and have tons and tons of water on it, but a little bit helps it happen. And again, having a little bit of this slurry while we start, really helps speed up the work of this stone. So we've got our angle. Two fingers from our secondary hand are coming down near the edge, and we're lifting up our thumb, ring finger, and pinky. Don't curl them up into your palm, because after when you start working, they'll start hanging down. If you should slip, you don't want anything in the way. Using the center axis of the stone as our Guiding uh, our guiding kind of lodestone here. We're going to work the knife from the heel to the tip, moving the handle away from the knife, 
keeping those secondary hand fingers on the blade over the center of the stone. Keeping the, the secondary hand fingers over the center of the stone gives us consistency and it's much, much safer. One thing that's important is that the tip of the knife will not be leading the way. These fingers will be leading the way. This angle is going to stay consistent throughout our work. As mud builds up on the side of your knife, you want to clean that off as well. You want to have a nice clean, dry knife, clean, dry fingers, help you from slipping around. So again, we're starting from the heel. We're putting two fingers down, just enough pressure so that the ends of your fingernails go white, but not so much that your knuckles lose color. That's an indication you're pushing too hard. Nice light pressure. The job of these fingers is just to guide the contact point rather than jam the knife into the stone. We're starting in the heel. After half a dozen or so strokes, walk up a little bit. And another half dozen so strokes and pull the handle away from the stone and walk those fingers up again. With practice, you'll keep this angle flat as you go. This is the, the difficult thing with sharpening is keeping a flat angle and working curved tips. I'm lifting the handle as I come back towards myself and lowering it on the outstroke. What that'll look like is lifting, and that comes with your wrist and elbow together. So the, your forearm, hand, and knife are like one fused unit while you're working. We're not gonna be working independently at the wrist. Remember, your wrist is locked. So let's test and see if we have a burr. This knife wasn't too dull. I have a little bit of a burr started. This is the outside of the blade. So as you're holding, working with your knife, outside or omote, and then the inside or the ura is what we're gonna do separate. So now we're going to be working the inside of the blade. I'm right-handed and I'm holding the blade, the hand knife with my left hand. And it's not like it's writing with your uh, secondary hand. Dominant hand is still gonna be controlling the work, but from the blade rather than the handle. Now we have the same grip, which is based off of pinch grip, thumb goes into the heel, forefinger up onto the spine, and again, make sure that finger doesn't hang down too much. We're gonna use the corner of your finger. Before we had two fingers coming down to allow uh, for a consistent contact point between the blade and the stone, here we're gonna be adding the thumb, and the idea here is that we're going to be pushing this hand is going to be directing all the motion. Secondary hand is just following suit, following the instructions that are being laid down by the dominant hand on the blade. You'll notice my ring finger and pinky are up and out of the way. If you tuck them into your palm in about five minutes or so, they're gonna start hanging down and be in harm's way. Should you slip, you don't wanna catch them. You'll notice I'm let, allowing the slurry to build up on the stone. This is really helpful for this stone. If you wash away the slurry as you go, you're gonna slow down the cutting ability of the stone. It's designed to have loose rolling grit along with the harder substrate. You'll see that there's some mud building up. As we're working, I like to clean this off with a knife, however. This can get slippery. Clean and dry knife is gonna be a lot safer. Our other big safety uh, protocol that we're gonna follow here, and I think this might be one of the more important ones from my experience, at least, um, this is the biggest uh, safety measure that I take while I'm sharpening, is I never allow my fingers to go over the end of the stone you'll see there's a little guillotine that forms between the blade and the end of the stone in this area. If you're working and your finger slips, guillotine should be sufficient to say what happens. So these fingers here that are on the blade, be they your dominant hand pushing the blade 
where your secondary hand's putting some gentle pressure down while your dominant hand pushes from the handle. Whatever the case, those fingers need to always stay over the stone. We're working off the center axis of the stone. This is the direction that we're moving in during all phases of sharpening from the heel all the way to the tip. The tip offers a little bit of a challenge being curved. It needs a little lift. If your knife is extremely flexible, you can press down gently and get the knife in contact. However, that's rarely the case. What we're going to be doing is lifting the handle towards the ceiling on the end stroke until the point where the tip and the stone contact, and then on the out stroke coming out, pushing the handle down toward, back towards the table. You'll hear this little swish. And that's an indication that you've moved the contact from the tip back into this zone here. Once you get that motion down, this part sharpens really quickly. On a flat area, all the work is dispersed over a larger area, so it takes more strokes to remove metal. On a curved knife or a curved tip, the work is focused into one little area, so while it's a more difficult uh, operation to do that little lift, the work actually happens fairly quickly if you're getting the contact right. So now I've worked on each side of the blade, the outside and the inside. I'm gonna take a look at the symmetry to see if it's what I'm after. Japanese knives can be sharpened asymmetrically. Typically Western knives are sharp, sharpened symmetrically, but there's really no rules with this. If your Japanese knife arrived from the factory with more grind on the outside than the inside, you can make it 50-50 uh, if you like. You can keep the asymmetry. Uh, asymmetry will give you a little bit uh, more precise work doing fine work. When you're cutting something large, it's gonna make the blade tra kind of travel in an arc a little bit. Uh, if you are cutting the same objects, most of the same, the same uh, ingredients, um, you know, you'll learn how to, how to curve the knife to, to avoid that, uh, that arcing. But uh, I'm looking for a burr, and I'm looking to see how wide the bevels are on each side to see if I have the kind of symmetry that I'm after. Now, I'm seeing that there's a little bit less work done on the inside than the outside. If this was my personal knife, I'd be satisfied with this. Next time that I sharpened, I would just come over to this inside that has less work done and lay a little more work down. However, this is a customer's knife here at the shop, and they said, I'd like this 50-50, then I'd go ahead and remove more metal off of this inside to make this bevel a little bit wider and make it more symmetrical. All right, we're happy with the work that we have done so far. We have a burr, and that feels like a roughness when you feel outward. Sometimes the burr will be going in different directions, uh, depending on how you've been sharpening. But here, you can kind of, uh, you can probably hear it actually. That's a pretty good burr. So this edge is ready to be honed. I'm gonna switch stones. Now I have a separate bath going for my fine stones than for my coarse and medium stones. I like to keep that grit separated. Same thing with flattening your, um, flattening your fine stones. One thing that I think is very important to pay attention to with the stones is hitting the corners as you flatten. I think I neglected to mention that, but this is really important. Doc does and they'll keep them from chipping and keep them from wanting to cut your knuckles as well. All right. So the purpose of this stone is to remove the scratches from this one and prepare it for stropping, for the burr to be removed. The finer the finish, not necessarily the better the finish. Some knives do much better with a slightly coarser polish than others. Uh, this is a little bit of user preference. Do some experiments if you have a couple different stones. One thing that's very important to uh, keep in mind, I think, is pay attention to how the knife cuts, you know, five or six hours of use down the line. Don't just focus on how the knife cuts right off of the stones. As well, I feel that cutting paper can be illustrative of whether you finish sharpening the knife. Cutting paper and cutting onions are different. Different knives will do better 
uh, with different finishes. You might find that a knife does uh, certain tests like cut paper or whatever beautifully, but when you take it to food, it feels dull after a couple uh, hours of work. And that could be that you've over polished it. This is a Arashiyama 6000 finish. It's not a super shiny, bright finish, but it's a real versatile one. Again, pinch grip, thumb in the heel, forefinger on the spine. Don't let that finger hang down too much. Two quarters. Spine on the end of the quarters, roughly, I don't know, 18 degrees. Totally making that up. I think a lot of sharpeners make up the angles they sharpen at. So you'll see some metal coming off. We're taking out the scratches from the previous thousand grit. You'll hear talk about flawless finishes and removing every single last scratch of the previous stone. Uh, this, in, in my experience, is maybe more of an aesthetic concern than a functional one. From my experience, having a nice flat bevel is going to be much more important than having a perfect polish that has no scratches from the previous stone. We do want to remove the broad majority of those scratches. We want to be intentional about how we're working, of course, but overworking this will lead us into shorter edge life. Flat bevels cut longer. They don't feel at all as quick. Sharpening shouldn't have to take you a super long time as well. So I'm going to visually inspect the bevel, turning it in the light a little bit, catching the reflection off it, seeing if I got those uh, scratches removed. You'll see that the scratches from the previous stone look quite a bit different. Here I still have some thousand grit scratches at the tip here, and I have a polish that kind of stops before the, the, uh, before the tip. So I want to remove those coarser scratches. I'm going to come in and focus on that. I always come and look at the heel as well. This is the, these two spots are the most difficult to get the contact in, so usually you have to come in and do a little more work in those spots. All right, so now we're going to come in and remove the scratches that are lingering from the thousand stone in a couple spots. Once I set the knife down, I like to keep it down, to keep that angle consistent. If you're picking up and putting down your knife a whole lot, then uh, your chances of ruining your angle are uh, increased quite a bit. The stone's getting a little bit dry and it's getting a little bit glazed. So I'm just gonna put a couple drops of water down. We don't need a ton of water here, but we wanna get enough to help liven up that mud again, pick up the metal from the surface of the stone. When we're sharpening wide bevels, either thinning double bevels or working single bevels, the presence of that mud is very important. Let's see how I did. All right, those little patches with the coarser scratches are gone on that side. We're looking good here as well. Again, we don't need to belabor this too much. There might be a couple little tiny spots that still have a few coarser scratches in it, but I'm not gonna lose my mind over those. It's gonna do just fine after I strop it. Again, our purpose is to keep those bevels straight. Here's a cork and rubber strop with chromium oxide on it. For the uh, purposes of our video, I have this strop away from the corner of the table, but otherwise I like to put this on the corner of my workspace so that I could really comfortably come in here, hang the handle off of uh, the edge of the strop. But for here, it's onto the middle of the table. We're pulling, and keep your angle low. You shouldn't hear a scrapey noise when you do this. If you hear a scraping noise, your angle is too high. We wanna do this at the same angle that we sharpened at. Again, keep that bevel nice and flat. This will help 
wear away any of that burr that's still hanging on. And our test for that could be cutting paper, could be shaving hair, seeing how it sticks on a fingernail, all that kind of stuff. Ultimately though, your real test for how sharp this knife is, and importantly as well, what the geometry is, is it going to cut well as cutting food? It's a food knife, so, you know, cut a pepper, an onion, a carrot, all those kind of things are great illustrations of what's happening with the edge and what's happening with the geometry behind the edge. Uh, and um, cutting boards are also important. We'll talk about that in a separate video. Uh, if your knife goes dull uh, before you feel like it should, a couple of things that might be happening, your bevels are rounded, or you're working on a cutting board that's dulling your knives right away. Congratulations, you made it through me talking for 20 odd minutes. And here's our finished results. Now, again, there's lots of different ways to do this. The uh, technique that I'm showing you is um, not one I invented, but it's the one that I've landed on. You know, in another 15 years, I'm sure it will uh, have evolved as well. So, um, you know, I like to, to, to remind uh, students who take classes uh, here at the shop that, you know, this isn't uh, offered in the spirit of being, you know, the right way to do it. It's a way that I find that works. And, um, you know, the proof's in the pudding like in anything else. I think that there's, um, you know, again, my opinion here, but I think there's a lot of stress that's put on the aesthetics of sharpening as opposed to the function. Um, a lot of people will kind of start overworking their edges. One thing that's important to uh, consider what I mean by overworking is that a blade will work by several different functions. There's the keenness of the edge, and then there's the geometry behind it. If you pinch and feel outward, you'll feel how thick that blade is behind the edge. This is a really important measurement. It's gonna tell you how that knife is gonna perform in a lot of different ingredients. If you have a dense vegetable, a, a, you know, a big red cabbage, something like that, a knife that's been sharpened in a lot and is more plow-like and wedgy is gonna um, kind of slow down in the middle of the cut. And as soon as you lose a bit of the keenness of the edge, it's gonna feel a little bit duller moving through carrots or onions or, you know, what have you. So these are some important uh, considerations with how your knife is gonna function. I am approaching the sharpening from a little bit more of a functional standpoint. I don't mean to disrespect anybody that, you know, uh, takes the time to make really beautiful finishes. I have a lot of respect for that kind of work. But I think that a lot of people get the perception, get the idea that you have to work like that if you're going to get good results. And, um, you know, depends what you're after. Are you, you after how the knife looks or how the knife functions or a little bit of both. But, um, you know, I think there's a little bit of a perception that um, Japanese sharpening is a, you know, art form that's, uh, you know, whose masters are these grumpy old men. And it really isn't the case at all. I've found um, a lot of the, the best sharpeners that I've met in Japan have been really laid back guys. And, um, you know, now, um, I don't know. I, I, I think that, that if it's not fun, it's not worth doing. I think you could relax a little bit and be stoked with your work. If you're just getting started, you're not going to get perfect results, but, um, you know, practice. Hope this video helps to that end. Um, if you dig what we're doing, subscribe and uh, like it and all that business. Thanks again.